Okay, over to you, Jasmine. Thanks. All right, I'm honored to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, speaker Harold Huss. In the for the sake of time, I will just let Harold tell him uh, tell us all about himself. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, invited to present a collection of my experiences uh, uh, that happen to form, you know, my own career trajectory that sort of goes from physics and over time, eventually to to biology. Uh, like many, uh, I got interested in science sort of early, maybe in in middle school, and uh, the setting of this was, uh, you know, in a small town down in central Illinois, and. Uh, so in high school, um, initially I was thinking about, well, okay, what's the, what's the large? Uh, and then transition to what's the smallest, where are atoms? And I always had an inclination to, to scientific gadgets and technologies and was into building model airplanes, rockets, got into cloud chambers. Uh, and for the science fair, I really got into that. It was a sort of a, a formative part wanted to make a particle accelerator. And being in a small town, you learn to be very resourceful in terms of uh, you know, trying to make the most of what you have. So for vacuum pumps, went out to the junkyard, flip out a compressor out of a refrigerator, reconfigure it, and you got a vacuum pump and do a little bit of glass blowing, et cetera. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, went off to the big city, the University of Chicago, and there I was lucky enough to uh, team up with uh, an effort, which was trying to build one million volt electron microscope for biology. Uh, this was very much ahead of its time. It was actually uh, an exciting time because at the, at the same time, uh, Albert Crew was imaging individual atoms. These were the first individual uh, high Z atoms which were, which were seen and actually movies were made. And I thought, well, this, this is fantastic, getting down to the smallest quantum of real things in a way. Um, from there, moved on, grad school, uh, initially interested in particle physics. Uh, that was sort of a little bit of too large of a scale. I was more interested in tabletop type things. So I gravitated toward low temperature physics and I always like extremes. So getting fundamentally cold was cool, so to speak. Uh, learned about a lot of different things, microwave electronics. The focus was on disordered systems like glasses. And for some reason to me, this really wasn't fully satisfying or had a sense of fundamentalness of physics. So in postdoc, I went to the other extreme trying to find what is the world's simplest system and was lucky enough to join an effort at MIT looking at the hydrogen atom. And there the idea was, can you collect hydrogen atoms, not molecules, cool them to make a Bose condensate, essentially getting the lowest temperature uh, altogether. Uh, an initial attempt uh, totally failed. It was sort of clueless where this could go after that. You know, sort of felt like, ah, my postdocs collapsed. But in desperation, you know, you come up with new ideas and sort of went off to, to formulate a, a direction for the field but, and had a good start on it, but decided in the end, I can't really stay in the field and left it. And it was painful, um, but I decided I would go to Bell Labs. And so now here, once starting off essentially in a new field and not knowing exactly what that is, that was uncomfortable, but at the, envi the environment at the time, people were looking into uh, scanning probe microscopy, like scanning tunneling microscopes. They had just seen atoms this way. And superconductors, high TC superconductors were all the rage at the time too. So I thought, well, maybe I evaporate electrons from a tip into a material and uh, uh, at low temperatures. And so I went off and developed low temperature probe microscopy. And I had a great run of that at Bell Labs, uh, developing a uh, scanning tunneling microscopes, doing spectroscopy on vortices, seeing them with magnetic probes, even imaging things with single electron probes. I mean, beauty of Bell Labs, you just have a lot of wonderful people around, people around and you can sort of leverage on uh, their skill. Uh, one example of that, final example from Bell Labs was uh, this fellow here, my good friend, 
Eric Betzik, he was imaging subdiffractive images with a near field microscope. These are like first images of molecules, individual molecules taken by him. And we decided to team up and look at quantum wells at low temperatures. You know, they glow, there's some broad spectral stuff. And when we looked at detail, we could see the individual atomic like spectra of individual centers in here, the quantum constituents of it. It was gets sort of spread out in this uh, Z direction uh, by looking at spectra. Now, Bell Labs was entering the real world. It was no longer a monopoly and relevance of the technology and the science was really you know, pressing on us. Uh, essentially the message was, well, you're a bunch of smart scientists. Why can't you drive the technology to make AT&T or later on Lucent, you know, a very good company. And so I ended up really taking all of this to heart and trying to develop instrumentation to <clears throat> check parameters of quantum well lasers, or even looked at spectroscopy of fruit, uh, which was part of a business unit where we were uh, selling cash registers essentially to grocery stores. And they had a problem with scanning barcodes on fruit because they don't exist. So maybe there are other ways to gather the data, but uh, cool challenges there. Um, but in the end, I decide, okay, I better leave. And this again was very painful transition. I uh, had a lot of success. I could have gone to university, but decided, no, the real challenge wasn't necessarily in trying to do small measurements, nanoscale. The big thing was the mega, the large scale, uh, or the giga, you know, there are millions of transistors. And I thought, well, I really need to get into that space, take that to heart and really understand it. And so went into industry, initially the hard disk drive industry, developed interferometers to sort of really scan it very fast. Uh, it was like the coolest, fastest, fundamentally best instrument, but no customer wanted to buy it. So I really had to learn myself what it means uh, to understand the concept of customer. This was, again, a little bit you know, gut-wrenching, but you know, it's, it's an important lesson to learn. I transitioned later on to looking at semiconductor chips, um, you know, and in using instruments like this, that industry has like the most amazing, you know, multi, you know, tens or hundreds of million dollars worth of instruments, you know, that can do this kind of high speed, large scale imaging. Um, but for some reason there are in some cases where the, the research direction and the market direction just didn't feel quite satisfying me. And I had a yearning to get back to the uh, basics. And so basically I decided to drop out from industry altogether. And my friend, Eric Betzik, uh, sort of was in a similar situation. So you could say, well, misery loves company. So we got together, tried to figure out new research directions, uh, met with other friends, considered all sorts of possibilities, refrigeration. And over in Tallahassee, we met a person who just happened to talk about certain blinking fluorescent proteins. And for us, a light went off. This is very similar to if you go up and down the spectral axis, that looks like a blinking molecule. And we thought, hey, here's a way to get subdiffractive resolution. We scrambled, put something together in my living room, uh, found a real biologist, the name of Jennifer Lippincart Schwartz and George Patterson. They told us what cells were. Uh, they led us into their lab. We worked uh, for a half a year and got the thing to work. And then uh, this new place came out of the mud called Genelia uh, Farms at the time, you know, by HHMI. And their mission was to innovate microscopes for understanding the connectome of uh, neural circuits. And uh, so I thought, well, here's a similarity between all of the circuits of a chip and maybe the circuits of a fly. Maybe we can sort of configure some microscopes to be able to be appropriate for that problem. And we spent about a decade fixing up these machines so that they could image, you know, the whole circuitry of a, of a fly brain. And it has other implications too. Finally, in the semiconductor industry, there are these high-speed multi-beam imaging systems, which have been developed for them 
and they are now appearing also in the biology side and we're having fun time also trying to bring in uh, these, combine it with some uh, surface science-like apparatuses and milling to be able to get three-dimensional images uh, of biology on a scale that hasn't really been explored before. So if you step back and look at everything, I'd say uh, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, connect, especially the longer you're around, you find different aspects can be recycled later, especially if you were lucky enough to sort of bounce around in diverse areas. And it really gives a lot of power to exploring new areas and a sense of freedom, which is really, really cool and great. So finally, a quick little, my own guiding principles, not necessarily good for anybody, but you know, for me, the, the path is really goal, is the goal, not really the end of it. And for me, that path is, I have a passion for the new technology and how it can impact the science. Uh, so I might be a person who steps back a little bit from the science itself directly, but just empower on the technology side. Um, from my experiences, I've learned to be very resourceful. I think that's important. And you know, it's great to seek out very diverse experiences. I mean, I usually tended to shy away from the next obvious step and then try to take something a little bit radically different. And uh, again, it can be very stressful to do that, but in the end, it's really empowering. Um, so don't let other goals deflect. There are sometimes security or other things can get in the way. Uh, sometimes that's important. This is not necessarily uh, a fully global principle. I tend to agonize a lot about meaning and relevance. Um, and for me, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of dots to connect to. And I consider myself super lucky to be able to live this. As a scientist, you know, we're really, really privileged to be able to do what we love to do. Not many people have that. And finally, I just want to say a lot of these things that I do or we do, it's, it's really shared. You know, a lot of people have visions of trying to understand, do microscopy with electron microscopes or other new microscopes, you know, for decades or maybe even centuries. So we're part of a big group and, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be part of it. So thanks. Great, thank you so much, Harold, for that um, really inspiring talk. I think Sri had a question that she wanted to ask, so I will pass it on to her. Uh, thank you so much, Harold. I mean, thank you. That, that was a relentlessly inspiring talk. Um, I, I am trying to gather my thoughts. <laughs> you, you mentioned, so, so much of the theme of the talk to me seemed to be a brave choice to leave the familiar and pursue the unfamiliar. And you had a great many points about elaborating on this on your last slide, but I wonder if you would tell us a little bit more about the loss of community that comes from leaving the familiar and how you kept some core community intact as you move through these different communities. Yeah, I could say, some of that's luck. I mean, when you do leave things and venture off into new areas, you know, there's nothing guaranteed. You know, many, in many cases, there could have been a good chance that we might not have been able to come up. I mean, I was lucky with Eric to be able to land on my feet again. And uh, uh, sometimes when making a choice, uh, I'm trying to think hard about it. You know, okay, I could sort of continue in this direction that could be very productive, a lot of fun. Uh, for example, scanning probe microscopies. Um, but what really bothered me is like, well, it wasn't connecting to this bigger thing in the world, which was the technology. And I thought, well, gosh, maybe the bigger principle, maybe not fully appreciated by the, uh, you know, a lot of the academic world at the time was really investing in the large numbers. I mean, that's really happening broadly right now, uh, but back then maybe it wasn't fully appreciated, but certainly the industry was well on that path. And I just put myself into a place where here's an environment where I'll just breathe that kind of problem space. 
and you know maybe benefit from it somehow and for some lucky reason you know it worked at least for me no guarantees but i got lucky thank you so much thanks so much Thank Harold. um for the sake of time i will pass it on to charlie to 